You've probably seen those glowing red light masks on social media, right? They look like they're from outer space and they are called game changers for younger looking skin, more hydrated, more glowy, smoother skin, lifted skin, all the things. And you're probably wondering, okay, do they really work? Should I really invest three to $500 on one? Or is it just clickbait? And that is exactly what we're going to dive into today. I'm Dr. Ray, I'm a board certified dermatologist, and I have 15 years of experience treating aging faces. And today we're going to get into the science behind red light masks. We will touch on how they actually work, and we will go over some of the clinical studies that actually show us if they work or not. I will translate it all for you, so you don't need a medical degree to understand what's going on. And I will conclude with what the heck you should actually do when it comes to red light masks. Should you get one or should you not? So red light therapy, also called LED therapy, uses specific wavelengths of red light and near infrared light, typically in the 630 to 660 nanometer range for red light and the 830 nanometer range for near infrared to trigger cellular repair and collagen production via a process we called photobiomodulation. What that means is that light is used to stimulate or slow down natural biological processes that are already happening in our body and in this case in our skin. So photobiomodulation is not a new concept. It has been around since the 1960s and it's not just for pretty skin either. It has been used and tested for things like osteoarthritis because of its anti-inflammatory effects in pain reduction, at least in animal models like mice and rats and also in wound healing. We do think that red light actually does simulate wound healing. So why is it that just now in the last couple of years, there has been this huge wave of popularity around that red light? What is going on? I can tell you that there isn't a new groundbreaking study that has come out and that's why everybody's rushing to get those red light masks now. It's not that. If you wanna know the answer to why something is popular when it comes to skincare these days, you just need to look to social media <laughs> because more people are talking about it online now, right? Like whereas 10 years ago, probably nobody had ever heard of red light for skin rejuvenation and didn't even know it was a thing. But now it's pretty much a, a household term. Most people who care about skin at all and are online <laughs> know about red light. And these red light masks are very Insta-worthy, aren't they? They're really cool looking online and you can make a lot of really cool posts about it. So does that mean that it is all it's cracked up to be, that it really is a game changer? Let's get into it. So the truth is that there are a good number of clinical studies that look at the effects of red light on skin rejuvenation. The results are a bit mixed. They are not as robust as the tried and true things that we know and love like retinoids and sunscreen and sun protection. But it is clear that red light does do something. So how does it do that something? Red light penetrates the skin and it is absorbed by the mitochondria, which are the little energy factories inside the cell. That is where your cell makes ATP, which is the energy that fuels all of the biological processes that are happening inside your cells. And red light simulates more ATP production, more energy production, and it also stimulates other natural processes like wound healing and reducing inflammation. And also very importantly for skin, it stimulates the re reproduction and growth of cells, including fibroblasts. And fibroblasts are the cells that produce collagen and elastin in your skin, in the dermis, in that second layer of skin. And so why is this important? How does this affect our skin health and beauty? and how it functions. Collagen is the scaffold of the skin. It gives your skin its structure and elastin gives it its bounce back quality. So when you pinch your skin, it bounces back, right? That is because of elastin. And so that is why we, when we have more collagen and more elastin in our skin, our skin functions better, it is more healthy and it is more youthful appearing and acting. And one more important thing that red light does is that it dilates those blood vessels in your skin allowing more blood flow into your skin, which is then delivering more oxygen and nutrients into your skin, which again is boosting your skin health and function and healthy skin looks better. So I mentioned red light and I also mentioned near infrared light. A lot of masks do include near infrared light, again, in that 830 nanometer or so range. And why is that? The reason is that near infrared actually penetrates deeper than red light does into your skin because it is a longer wavelength. The longer the wavelength, the deeper it penetrates into the skin. And it has similar effects, although it does so in a different way than the red light. It doesn't necessarily affect the mitochondria, 
but similar effects on production of collagen and elastin and potentially even to a higher degree because because it is penetrating deeper it is getting deeper into the skin it is contacting more cells and potentially having a greater effect so you will see some masks that combine both red light and newer infrared light so you're getting the benefits of both and then just briefly to touch on the other colors that you might see in these masks one is blue light and blue light really its effect on anti-aging is not really significant blue light is used largely for improving acne and then yellow and green light have some evidence for anti-aging but pretty slight and even less than red light. So when it comes to yellow and green, I would not worry about it. I would not look for those things in a mask necessarily. If it's in there, great. If it's not, don't sweat it. Okay, so how effective is red light? Let's get into that. So most of the studies we have are small clinical trials. Some of them are randomized placebo controlled trials. Those are the highest quality studies that we like to see. And then others are also small, but don't have a placebo and at baseline, those kinds of studies are lower quality, which means that their data, the results are less reliable. Okay, so what do those high quality randomized controlled trials show? One of the most rigorous studies that I found was a randomized controlled trial. It was a split face study, so half the face was treated and half the face was not. It was placebo controlled and double blind, meaning that the person being treated and the person evaluating the person being treated were both blind meaning they did not know uh, which side was treated and which side wasn't. This study was done in 76 patients and it combined red light and infrared light. And that study showed that on average, there was about a 20% improvement in wrinkle depth as measured by a machine. And that's one thing we love to see in clinical studies is when there is machine grading of things like wrinkle depth or skin texture or roughness or skin hydration and elasticity. So those things can be measured by devices. And yeah, this study did use devices to measure some of these parameters. So again, there was about a 20% reduction in wrinkle depth in the areas treated with the red and infrared light. And then in addition, there was about a 10% improvement in skin elasticity as well. Again, machine measured by a machine. And also one more thing that I loved to see in the study was that they confirmed these changes histologically, meaning that they did biopsies on the skin both before and after treatment, and they demonstrated an increase in the density of both collagen and elastin fibers before and after treatment. Okay, so that is promising, right? But let's keep in mind it is one study. There was another study that was done comparing red light to white light. And that was done on about 50 patients. And in that study, there was a machine that graded the roughness of the skin, and they did show a bit of improvement in roughness. They called it a significant improvement in roughness. Now, when you look at the numbers, there was actually about a four and a half percent improvement in roughness before and after treatment with both the red light and the white light. And there wasn't a difference between those treatment groups. Now, when they say significant, and I want you to remember this for the rest of your life, when you see or hear or read a clinical study that says that they showed significant improvement in, I want you to always go look at the numbers because when they say significant, they're all often talking about statistical significance. What that means is that their findings that they found, that they demonstrated, were most likely not due to chance and were most likely due to the intervention. And that is the definition of statistical significance. There's an actual number we look for that. It's called a p-value. We want it less than 0.05. And so if it is less than 0.05, it is statistically significant. Does that mean that it is actually significant in terms of what you're actually going to see on your skin or the clinical significance? That is something else, right? So is a 4.5% improvement in roughness significant to you if you use a red light twice a week for a month and saw a 4%, 5% improvement in roughness. Is that something you're even going to notice when you look in the mirror? Are you going to be satisfied with that? Is that significant to you? So that is what I mean by always be a bit wary of when you see that word significant and don't take it for face value. Always look at the numbers. Okay. So that was with regard to roughness and that was machine graded. They also had three blinded dermatologists evaluating the wrinkles and these were wrinkles around the eyes and evaluating the wrinkles between the red treated group and the white light treated group. And they found that there was no improvement before and after treatment 
in either group. So that was the second study. And beyond that, there are a number of small trials that show a mild to modest improvement. So things like wrinkle depth and roughness and skin hydration and elasticity, those kinds of things, when there is an improvement, typically it is fairly subtle. So that 20% or so improvement that I cited in the first study is one of the higher kind of effects that we've seen in these studies, but in general, they are not quite so high. And then there are also a number of studies that actually do those biopsies again, where they're measuring the degree of collagen and elastin change before treatment and after treatment. And those studies do in general show an increase in the collagen and elastin. The max I saw was about 30% improvement in, or increase in density in the collagen and about 20% increase in density of elastin. So that is on a microscopic level, right? So that's always good to see. Does it mean that you're going to notice that effect on your skin in the form of improved wrinkles? That's a whole other thing. And that's why they do the clinical gradings as well. But it's always nice to see that histologic or microscopic evidence. So what is the bottom line here? The bottom line is that the effects of red light are real, but subtle, okay? And it is not magic. It is not the game changer that everyone claims it is. And it is not a replacement for in-office treatments that stimulate collagen and elastin. So I want you to think of it sort of like a supportive habit, okay? Think of it as kind of nutrition for your skin. And if you have already dialed in a really stellar home regimen using the goat of anti-aging retinoids and other well-proven ingredients, and beyond that, you want to do more for your skin, then yes, get it, but view it as preventative rather than in terms of reversing, especially when we're talking about any sagging or deeper wrinkles that are already there. If you view it as more preventative, you will not be disappointed. And then the last thing I want to leave you with is that please don't invest in a mask if you are not fairly certain that you can commit to using it a minimum of three times a week. And I will say that is the biggest barrier to people actually using these things, and it will not work if you are not consistent with it. So a minimum of three times a week, and that's another thing that I didn't mention about the studies, but there is a lot of variability in terms of the regimen that was studied. Some were done twice a week, some were done seven days a week, or five days a week, or three days a week, some for three minutes, some for 10 minutes, some for 20 minutes. So there's no standardization of the timing, the frequency, how long you need to use it for and how often, right? So because of that, it's a little bit harder to gauge, you know, what you're actually getting. So typically I just tell people, you go by what the manufacturer of that device says, what their protocol is um, in terms of how often you need to use the mask and for how long. A lot of the devices have a self timer. So you put it on and you turn it on and it turns off on its own after the, the treatment period, which might be three minutes. It might be 10 minutes, depending on the device. Okay. So go by what the manufacturer says and what their instructions are. But yeah, if you don't think you can commit to at least a minimum of three days a week, if not more often, then it is just not worth the investment. You're just going to be taking that three to $500 and throwing it in the trash because consistency is key with everything, including this. So I will link below a few of the masks that I typically recommend to patients and to clients in my digital programs. And if you have any questions about red light, any other questions, please pop them in the comments. If you haven't subscribed, please subscribe and we'll talk again next time.